everyone! In this video, we'll be analysing Robert Browning's poem, My Last Duchess. Robert Browning was born in 1812 in London, and he died in 1886 at the age of 77. Browning was brought up in an intellectual household, and he had been proficient in Latin, Greek and French since a young age. He was an admirer of the Romantic poets, and especially of Percy Bysshe Shelley. So much so, he had followed in his idol's footsteps and became a vegetarian and an atheist himself. Interestingly, Browning started off his writing career with ambitions to be a playwright, but his plays, namely Stratford, which ran for five nights in 1937, and Bells and Pomegranates, were largely unsuccessful. That said, his attempts at drama were not all lost, as they had laid the foundation for his dramatic monologues, which would go on to become some of his most widely known works. Browning married fellow poet Elizabeth Barrett after reading her 1844 poems and exchanging letters for several months. Back then, Elizabeth Barrett, in fact, had a more established reputation than her husband. And despite the Browning's equal stature today, Robert Browning was largely known as Elizabeth Barrett's husband while she was still alive. The two moved to Italy after their marriage, where they lived until Barrett Browning's death in 1861, although Browning himself would eventually return to Italy in his final years. Browning's real career break came with the publication of his book-length epic, The Ring and the Book, which was serialised from 1868 to 1869. The first Browning Society was established in 1881, five years before Browning's death. This society is an association of readers who would regularly meet to discuss Browning's poetry, publish guides to his works, and stage versions of his plays. Today, Robert Browning is arguably one of the most important Victorian poets in English literature. Now, no discussion of Robert Browning would be complete without an introduction to the dramatic monologue, seeing as the poet is most famous for this form. To understand what a dramatic monologue is, let's take a look at these two definitions. It is a poem in which an imagined speaker addresses a silent listener, who's usually not the reader. And it is a poem written in the form of a speech of an individual character, which compresses into a single vivid scene a narrative sense of the speaker's history and psychological insight into the character. Now, the second definition from the Britannica Encyclopedia is probably a little bit more helpful here, because it states the important criterion of giving psychological insight into the speaker's character. Etymologically, Mono is the prefix for one, whereas log is the suffix for something that is said or written, or a speech. Hence, the word monologue literally means one person's speech. But what lends the speech its dramatic quality is in fact the psychology that lurks behind it, which often boils down to the understanding of the motivation behind a key action in the narrative. So the thing to expect from a dramatic monologue is a speaker who can tell an engaging story about a major event, which in turn conveys for the reader a broader theme or message. If it helps, we can think of this poetic form as a condensed film. But instead of it being a visual enactment, it's in fact a verbal performance that contains a beginning, a climax and an ending. Now the existence of verse monologues goes way back in history, and you can find examples from as early as the Anglo-Saxon period, such as this dramatic monologue called The Wanderer. But the form only really started to gain popular currency in the Victorian era in the 19th century, when poets such as Robert Browning and Alfred Lord Tennyson made a conscious effort to distinguish between the voices of the real poet and the fictional speaker. Now, the split between poet and speaker both reinvigorated and complicated the form, 
because on the one hand, it allows for the exploration of personalities and character types radically different from the poet him or herself, which freed the monologue form from any didactic or moral obligations, because the poet now no longer tells us what he or she thinks we, quote unquote, should know. However, this also makes the task of interpreting the dramatic monologue a little bit more elusive for the reader, because we now have to discern if the speaker's message is, sotto voce, also the poet's, which can be a somewhat problematic premise if the speaker's message is criminal or immoral. So now that we understand what the dramatic monologue is, let's take a look at how this form opens up the psychological depth of the speaker in My Last Duchess. I will now read the poem aloud once, but if you wish to do that yourself, please click pause and return to the video once you're done. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Would it please you sit and look at her? I said, Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turn, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I. And seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not a husband's presence only. Called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, Her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, it was all one. My favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west. The bough of cherries some officious fall broke in the orchard for her. The white mule she rode with round the terrace. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush, at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift, who'd stoop to blame the sort of trifling. Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one, and say, Just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss, or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat. The count your master's no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. A bit of context before we dive into the poem proper. Published in 1842, 
my last duchess is allegedly based on the first marriage of Alfonso Il Dieste, the fifth Duke of Ferrara, to the 14-year-old Lucretia de' Medici, daughter of the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Well, this marriage was controversial because Lucretia died under suspicious circumstances only three years after marrying the Duke, who had abandoned her out of boredom early on in their marriage. Rumour has it that the Duke himself had killed his wife, but concrete evidence for this was never found. Nevertheless, this historical interlude was inspiration enough for Browning, who filled in the backstory of the murder by fleshing out the Duke's motive in the poem. Now, it's pretty clear that Duchess is ostensibly a poem about the heartless murder of a wife. And by extension, it is also about the power imbalance in a relationship where the man has the upper hand. But equally, it is also concerned with the idea of looking as a form of transgression. And to analyse this, let's take a look at the motif of sight. Now, what you'll notice from these lines is what we call the lexical field of sight, as there are all these references to looking, look, glance, and notice. As a key motif in the poem, the act of looking carries very different consequences for male and female agents. Whereas the Duchess is killed because apparently her looks went everywhere, the men in the poem, namely the Duke and to a lesser extent, the Count's emissary, wield their authority by transforming the Duchess into a sterile object, i.e. a painting. Now this notion of wayward sight is highlighted by the momentary divergence from the end rhyme pattern of this poem, with the words countenance and glance being sonic anomalies as I rhymes. The Duke's reference to the depth and passion of its earnest glance isn't so much a praise of his wife's emotional loyalty as it is a jibe at her refusal to obey her husband, which is suggested by the wayward glance that's both symbolically and sonically decoupled from her countenance. After all, countenance and glance, they don't sound similar, but they look alike. The polyptotin of looking and look establishes this thematic centrality of sight. But whereas the woman is passively looking as if she were alive, the implication being that she's dead and as such is now stripped of her agency to look, one man is now inviting another man to please you sit and look at her. All the while, the Duke is maintaining absolute control over who gets to look at his last duchess with a parenthetical footnote, quote, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I. So we see that the Duke is a man whose jealousy knows no bounds, and we soon discover that it is his late Duchess's looking too much, supposedly, and looking everywhere, which has led to her death. poem reaches its end, we see another pair of eye rhyme, which spans lines 45 to 47. This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Now like countenance and glance, commands and stands are a pair of eye rhyme. The break they affect to the end rhyme scheme is appropriate to the incident implied here which is the Duke's murder of the Duchess, or quite literally, his breaking of her life. Our knowledge of his murder is gained from his euphemism of then all smiles stopped together and she stands as if alive. And the Zajura after this grew and I gave commands create this asyndetic structure which breaks up the flow of the line and renders the phrase this grew as a spondaic unit with stresses falling on both words, which emphasises the inevitability of the Duchess' end. Moving on to metre. In a poem that follows a largely iambic pentameter structure, 
The only hypercatalectic line in this 56 line monologue stands out for comment. And it comes about halfway through the monologue in line 30. Would draw from her alike the approving speech. Now the extra syllable in this line hinges not on the final word, speech, but instead on the second word, which is the verb, draw. Because it is by allowing her speech and blush to be drawn out that has sealed the Duchess's fate. That anything beyond his own attention should invite his wife's approving speech or blush only serves to inflame the Duke's jealous tendencies because the husband sees his wife's positive response to anything other than himself as a symptom of infidelity, disobedience, and transgression. So this line is evidence enough for the Duke that his last Duchess was up to no good and was going beyond the acceptable limits that he's mentally prescribed for her. And indeed, this sentiment of overstepping is echoed later in line 39, when the Duke imagines chastising his late wife for, quote, exceeding the mark. But is the Duke's jealousy justified? Well, from the string of references he makes to the all in each that invite the Duchess's pleasure, it seems that he's driven to jealous madness by his own irrational assumptions. We know this because the things she's blushed at are all rather innocuous. They include a brooch that the Duke's gifted her, quote, my favour at her breast, the delight of sunset, which is indicated by the dropping of daylight in the west, a bough of cherries that someone has picked for her, and the experience of riding a white mule round the terrace. Now, normally, none of this should suggest to the Duke any intention of cuckoldry or infidelity. But because the Duke's mind is so preoccupied with anxieties of sexual betrayal, he sees proof when there is none. The symbolism of breaking cherries is especially interesting. The association of the cherry with virginity is a popular motif in the Bible and was well featured in medieval and Renaissance art as we can see in Titian's Madonna of the Cherries. To use an anachronistic phrase, popping someone's cherry also means deflowering a girl. And so the Duke's obsession here is not only limited to monopolizing his young wife's attention, but also with gaining total control over the woman's body and over her identity. And likewise, the image of a woman riding a white mule evokes this idea of female sexual agency, with the woman taking the reins over an animal that symbolises masculinity. You get the idea. So this, of course, is something that a chauvinist like the Duke can't possibly stomach. Now, another device in this poem which exposes the Duke's psychology is the use of interpolated speech. This is especially interesting in the context of a dramatic monologue, because we know that a monologue is the speech of a single character. But if we pay attention to the nature of those inserted quotes in the poem, we'll notice that they are all imagined, but not reported speech. For example, we see this in line 15 to 19. When the Duke says, perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. The hedging word, perhaps, is actually the clue that reveals the imagined nature of the Duke's suspicions of Fra Pandolf, who happens to be the painter he had commissioned to produce the Duchess portrait. The Duke's paranoid mind comes through in the personification of paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat, which is a comment that he fantasizes the painter had to have made in response to the Duchess' rosy complexion. The reference to dies along her throat rings doubly sinister and confirms the ghastly realization we would have formed from the Duke's earlier euphemistic remark of his Duchess 
quote, looking as if she were alive. With the implication being that she is now dead and the only remaining trace of her existence is a painting. But we soon see that the Duke isn't only paranoid and psychopathic. He's actually also self-obsessed and self-conscious. When he explains why he never confronted the Duchess on the alleged infidelity, he claims that even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, quote, just this or that and you disgust me, here you miss or that exceed the mark, end quote, etc., To say that he has not skill in speech is of course ironic and also an example of apophysis, which is the device of bringing up a subject only to deny it. Well, this is ironic because we know that the entire monologue is an exercise in using rhetorical manipulation to mask a criminal act. But the ambiguity of just this or that and here or there, exposes the baselessness of his accusations towards the Duchess, which are probably made up to fulfil his murderous desires. The Palimpton of stooping and never to stoop reveals as well that fundamental disdain, indeed in the word disgust, that he feels towards the Duchess. And not for any wrong she's done him, most probably, but rather for the fact that she's socially beneath him and of her not deserving his, quote, gift of a 900 years old name, which we see in line 33. So we find out that actually the Duke doesn't even want to engage with the Duchess in an argument because he deems her unworthy of having a real dialogue with. And an argument is likely to have transpired had he initiated it because he implies that she won't, quote, let herself be lessened so. So the Duke's alternative is simple, quick, and ruthless, and that is to kill her off and turn her into property for a session. Finally, the monologue ends on a heavy dose of dramatic irony, which is delivered through another instance of apophysis, when the Duke insists that it is not the dowry, but the Count's daughter, which he hopes to win. Yet he says this only after reminding the emissary that, I repeat, the Count your master's no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. So just to clarify what he's saying here, because it's quite convoluted, the Duke is saying that there is no reason for someone who is as generous as the Count to deny the Duke's request for a dowry. But of course, the Duke insists that he's not really after the money of the dowry, but he's after the hand of the Count's daughter. But of course, The very fact that he says this makes us suspect what he's really after. Well, with this paraphrastic jumble of equivocation, we realise that the Duke's pride in his so-called 900 years old name is but a hollow one. Because instead of women marrying him for his family name, we see that the likelier situation is that he is the one who propositions himself to other families in exchange for wealth. And as the poem ends with the Duke flaunting a bronze Neptune statue to the emissary, we see the portrait of a man beset by a narcissistic need for external approval, while his allusion to the Roman sea god Neptune, quote, taming a seahorse, suggests a possible parallel to his own possessive need to tame wives and exposes the delusional grandiosity of his mind. So that's it everyone. If you find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for other GCSE and A-level English literature videos. Make sure you check out the blog post for this in the description box below. And don't forget to leave me a comment so that you let me know what you're studying and what else you want to see from this channel in the future. See you very soon.